My guest today is media critic and feminist powerhouse, Jennifer Posner. Her first book, Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth About Guilty Pleasure TV, was called Required Reading for Every American Girl and Woman. She's here today to talk about her upcoming book, Breaking the News, a critical media literacy graphic novel uh, through explicit through an explicitly race and gender lens. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Juliana. Ah, oh, it's uh, always a pleasure. Talk about your new book that you're working on. Talk about breaking the news and what inspired you to write it. Okay, well, so this is uh, both the culmination of everything I've ever done before and also nothing I've ever done before. It is a Ooh. graphic novel. I am. This is incredibly... Um, tricky and weird and interesting to translate uh, my entire career of media criticism and media literacy education into a format that's mostly visual, mm -hmm. um, which I've never done before. So with the graphic novel, I, you know, my last book, I was the weirdo who said, oh, you can't pay me a big enough advance. Let me write a hundred extra pages. <laughs> <laughs> like, let me do more work because there's more information. Um, you, you wanted to print a shorter book, I'll write a longer book because it's, <laughs> right? Um, but with a graphic novel, uh, even though I have another, you know, 350, 400 pages of media literacy information in my head that I'd love to get across, a graphic novel of 250 or so pages is mostly art. Mm -hmm. So every page I have to get across an entire, what I would normally get across an entire chapter in, a, in two or three sentences. Um, Who's, are you, you're not drawing the, the pictures, no. are you? No, no, I'm working with uh, an Eisner Award winning graphic artist named Gideon Kendall, mm -hmm. uh, and he's brilliant. Uh, and I'm writing the script and I'm giving a lot of, so I'm not just writing the ideas, I'm, I'm in most cases writing the entire script. You know, this is what we should draw here. Um, can, the, can we make, you know, can we make a Frankenbite monster out of sound bites in the chapter that's talking about manipulative editing and how to separate text from subtext? Can we, uh, once we interview, once I interview the uh, former reality TV producer about how they create manipulative um, uh, scenes that don't actually exist to make a viewer think that somebody said one thing about somebody else when they were really talking about a third topic on a fourth day, mm -hmm. can we turn that into an actual Frankenbite monster by using little clips? And so, you know, I, I have these ideas, but I can't, I'm not an artist. I can't draw. Mm -hmm. um, and he is, he's uh, Gideon is a brilliant uh, artist who's taking my ideas and elevating them. So when I say, I think I want to do something like this. He's like, oh, how about we do it this way and then up here and it's through the stratosphere. But the goal of the media literacy graphic novel is to really encourage people to become active, critical media consumers and media makers. Mm -hmm. So uh, being able to understand how media messages are framed, um, what the impact of that kind of messaging is, which stories and voices and communities get included in both news and entertainment and advertising narratives, whose voices and communities and issues get excluded. Um, and- Do you think we would be surprised by some of this, a lot of this information? I mean, people have a general idea of who's being included, but excluded. What are the more surprising areas that you think people really could use an education about? Oh God, so much of it. I think one of the things that, um, that we get wrong as media consumers is we believe uh, consistently across the board, we think everybody else is affected by media, but we're too smart. We're too savvy to be impacted by media. Messages. I don't have that problem. I mean, I totally do. <laughs> right? right? It's, it's, we think sort of everybody else is sheep. There are these blind vessels for media control and propaganda and disinformation, but we understand, we control, we are, are the masters of our minds. But that, uh, we're all wrong. You just said it so perfectly. You, you run a TV show and yet you're still affected by media. I'm writing a book on media literacy. I'm still affected by media. Um, I interviewed uh, Jean Kilborn who's the mother of feminist advertising criticism. And she started doing uh, represent sort of looking at representations of women and the impact of representations of women in advertising on society in the 60s and 70s and was 
basically uh, considered trivial and laughed off the stage because nobody in the world was really talking about that. Now every college that teaches advertising in the world teaches her material. Um, I interviewed her and she said that she is even still inter uh, influenced by advertising. Um, and so that has impact across the board. It has impact in the way we think about politics, in the way we think about ourselves, our bodies, who we date, who we love, who we want to elect, um, what we assume uh, is and isn't valid for our health. Uh, we would understand, I think a lot of us would be really surprised to understand just how deep disinformation goes on social media and how much we individually, even as smart, sometimes very well-informed consumers contribute to disinformation, spreading it under, um, we would be, we would be surprised about our implicit biases mm -hmm. about say, um, female candidates for office. Like, I was just going to ask you about that. <laughs> Perfect timing for this. Exactly. Yes. Um, or, or how, how we would, I think a lot of people would be surprised, for example, about how watching 20 years of procedural crime shows, cop shows, even shows like Law and Order SVU, which masquerade as empowering toward victims, reinforce rape culture, um, uh, reinforce a really uh, troubling and misrepresentative idea of what civil liberties are and aren't and who has the right to break them um, in terms of police and law enforcement. Uh, we would be surprised that uh, whether it's cop shows that primarily portray people of color um, as uh, criminals and, uh, and victims of crimes, uh, versus as active agents in their own life, um, or whether it's news uh, coverage that statistically will underrepresent crimes by white people compared to the statistical proportion of crimes committed by white people mm -hmm. in the population and mm -hmm. overrepresent crimes committed by people of color, allegedly, um, in disproportionate nature to their uh, amount of people of color in the population, um, or the fact that uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, sort of media reception studies have shown that when you look at uh, the photos that are that run with crime stories, youth crime, for example, primarily you'll see uh, yearbook photos and family photos if the alleged perpetrator of a youth crime is a white youth. And you'll see perp walk photos and mm -hmm. mugshot photos if the photo is a black or brown person who's alleged to have, the youth who's alleged to have committed a crime. I so, just, we just looked at that on Fox News. They were still using an image of Michael Brown without us, without him smiling or whatever. I don't think it was the perp, obviously not the perp, a perp one, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't his, his high school yearbook photo. Sure. And I mean, and, and that's, and that's even the criminalization of black victims of crime is another incredibly uh, damaging issue in news coverage that we, I think a lot of people would not understand how that implicitly sways us to think about who in the country deserves empathy when they're the victim of a crime, who in the country deserves empathy when they commit a crime. For example, when police shoot unarmed people of color, in particular black people, um, we're supposed to feel like they have authority, like they must have had a reason, like they're the good guys, they must have been provoked. Um, what did that, for example, uh, in the ch chapter on framing there that I have, I have a deep dive on comparing and contrasting news coverage of uh, Michael Brown and his murder, um, a pro the profiles of Michael Brown in the New York Times versus the profiles of Michael Brown in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch within the month of his murder. And the New York Times profile, the frame was Michael Brown, he's no angel. He was no angel. And the entire, that was literally a, a phrase in, uh, that was used, the headline. Um, I believe it was the headline, but if not, it was in the lead. And the entire frame of the story was built to support that frame, uh, that that message, the idea that he must have done something to cause it. So they they dragged out things like um, uh, one time he was suspected in school of stealing somebody's somebody's. I think it was a Walkman or a or a or an iPod or something. And um, and his mother came and said, like, here's the receipt. This is this is his. 
And that was it. But they they included this fact that he was accused of theft, even though he did not steal anything in the school. Um, for example, well, the they, accusation was included, but not the the you know the the when he got shown to be uh, you know even they even I think they even mentioned that he that she disproved it, but like there was at the bottom, of, yeah, <laughs> no newsworthiness to the yeah. fact that somebody other than. If it was in the context, if they had included the context that he had been dogged by uh, discrimination within the school system, then there is a newsworthy element to, for a journalist to say, for example, here is a time when this student was accused, this black student was accused of stealing something that he did not steal and his mother had to go to school with the receipt to prove that he did not steal this thing. If they had contextualized that within the context of discrimination, okay, potentially. But to just mention, and they, and this was one of many examples of where the New York Times story tried to make Michael Brown seem like he had had a consistently troubled life full of mistakes that he had made. Um, and that that somehow, uh, the implicit uh, understanding that we're supposed to come away with from that story is somehow he brought this murder on himself. So the coverage uh, itself is is biased and misleading. Talk about who's being left out of of coverage uh, these days. Okay, so for that kind of question, we only have to look at uh, coverage, news coverage of immigration and uh, refugee uh, people who are fleeing uh, from oppressive and violent situations in their home countries. Um, in all of the stories, just count. The next time you see a number, a, a number of news stories, the next time there's a hook around, for example, the fact that we're keeping babies in cages in this country, in internment camps, that never again is now, now. Um, think, next time you see a flurry of those stories because something has happened, Look at who is quoted in those stories. Generally, the people quoted in the stories will be um, military or ICE sources, um, sometimes politicians. Sometimes the politicians will be for or against, sometimes both. They'll you know, sometimes do a, this politician says, yay, internment camps. This politician says, no, internment camps. Um, great. Uh, there, once in a while, often toward the end of the story, you'll have one quote, maybe two, shorter, less context from an activist who'll say, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this. Um, very, very rarely do you have equal voice given in those stories to immigrants, to refugees, mm -hmm. to parents separated from their kids, to people who are implicit, who, who are the subjects of these stories, for whom these stories themselves contribute to the continued exploitation of these people. How, very, very rarely do they get to speak for themselves. Democracy Now! does a pretty fairly good job uh, letting people occasionally speak for themselves. So that's, that's a plus, at least we have them. My question is for you about this. What, what, it seems like we have a celebrity culture, not just in Hollywood, but we have celebrity ICE agents and celebrity politician people and the one person you go and talk to when there's a war who is a celebrity. What does, where's the overlap between celebrity culture and what the big news media places think that people want to see and the fact that regular people who are being affected by issues don't get uh, the mic. Oh, there's there's so much um, in that. Uh, I so there. I'm going to piece out a bit of that question. So uh, one of the things that you said that stood out to, that you asked that stood out to me is about you know what media corporations think we want to see, and a lot of the time, even that is itself um, something that needs to be deconstructed because media corporations will often, whether it's the CEOs or the CFOs or the showrunners, um, will often say, or the studio heads uh, will often say, oh, we're just giving people what they want. When yes, they do a, say that. Right, as, an exa as a, um, a response to any kind of critique uh, of content, whether it's content that reinforces problematic uh, understanding of sexual assault or immigration or violence against people of color. Um, 
And in fact, very often, these media companies are not actually giving viewers what they want if what they're looking at is sort of market research. Uh, you know, a lot of the time, they're giving viewers what is uh, cheap and easy to produce. Mm -hmm. And so in those, so we are, we've been sold this idea that we get what we, uh, what we watch, right? The, you know, vote with your remote. That's a, that's a phrase that is used all the time, but that actually presupposes that we get a vote. Yeah. Right. But for example, with reality television, which is a, a key a vector for what you're saying about sort of celebrity being celebrities, even when you're not like people become celebrities from being on reality TV from they're not celebrities. They go on a show, they get humiliated and then all they're just celebrities. Later. They're not even talented. You could see why a talented person gains fame and notoriety for their talent. But these people are just just celebrities. And then they get a clothing line and then you're like, oh, I want to wear these shoes because so-and-so boobs wore them, you know, like, you know, or, or, or they've been humiliated and they're a national laughing stock, but now we want to get in on that laugh. Um, and now they, and now they get a, a, a spot in the white house, you know, it's, yeah. well, sure. I mean, I, that's now you're getting back to the index of reality bites back where, I mean, I, I just, I, I have to tell you Jokana, when I was, um, in 2015, during the campaign, um, I felt like that Simpson, the, the crazy cat lady, Simpson's character, like just throwing the guy, like, ah! I just, because <laughs> I transcribed almost every episode of The Apprentice from its debut in the early oh. 2000s until my book came out in 2010, because I had to write about that. So in, in the, um, uh, in the index of Reality Bites Back, you know, Trump, comma, Donald, um, sexual harassment lawsuits of, you know, uh, the Apprentice, uh, you know, sexual and racial discrimination lawsuit environment of um, you know, Donald Trump uh, fraud history. Uh, there's just like all these things that I documented and it was, I was trying to show. But the thing that we have to understand about whether it's, you know, people who become celebrities from reality TV, Trump is not that. Trump was a celebrity, um, then became a reality TV producer people don't understand that he wasn't just the host of that show he was the executive he was the co-executive producer of that show meaning he had full editorial control for how his persona was going to be represented so every time he used the n-word it was left on the cutting room floor every time he sexually harassed a woman on set it was left on the cutting room floor every time he did not he every time that he uh, gave really bad business advice that was somehow framed as, uh, you know, really decisive master of industry. And we were, we had that show beamed into American living rooms for nearly a decade, presenting this man as the exact opposite of the kind of person who he really was, which was a racist, a sexual assailant who ran all of his companies into almost all of his companies into bankruptcy. But Jen, how much do you think uh, this has to do with the fact that he won the presidency? But this is what I'm saying. He, this persona was of one of authority and, uh, and success and stability and every the the narrative in the apprentice was that everybody should aspire to be like trump if you work really hard you can be rich and powerful and successful like trump if you are decisive and you understand business and you understand what needs to happen you can be like trump so trump unless you're a woman anyway well, well, sure, right but a whole another story yeah Seriously, the misogyny was through the roof, even on air, not not to mention what was left on the cutting room floor. The misogyny on air was such that you could cut it with a knife. Um, but viewers were conditioned to completely re -under, uh, to, to reshape their understanding of who this man was. In New York, we knew, we New Yorkers who grew up with Trump in the tabloids understood this man as a buffoon, as a lifestyle of the rich and famous caricature yeah. but, but we, and and as a sleaze we understood him as a sleaze too but people who watch the apprentice understood him as somebody with an implicit business sense and authority who could steer america onto the right track and he was he he would say it like it is forget about this pc blah 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 he just cut through all the noise and gave you what you needed and and that's the persona he ran on mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so NBC, I've written a couple of pieces during 2015 and 2016 about how NBC was responsible for this election. Mm-hmm. NBC, Donald Trump, and, and Mark Burnett, who created The Apprentice with him, as well as uh, Survivor, um, are responsible for threatening democracy, putting babies in cages, and uh, you basically rising fascism in America. It's it's a pr- it's a it's a slow climb, but it's a steady, uninterrupted climb. Huh. I find that most TV is so horribly disgusting in its messaging and its subliminal messaging that I can barely watch anything. I have a really hard time watching like what passes for good, even good TV in the in the US these days. And I mean, like regular cable, I don't, you know, there are some good shows, there are some good things, but you have to dig through and slog through, you know, in order to find them. And even then, there's, there's always just the one thing and you're like, I'm off the show, I can't do it, you know? You know what's great though, is um, now there, the digging can happen, right? Because we have so many options, um, a lot of the time now we have to understand most of these options are still owned by the same few parent companies because of media consolidation and media economics, which I'm also going to be addressing in Breaking the News. Um, but because there are so many different channels and so much content and streaming platforms are also very hungry for content, um, that in conjunction with the rise of social media and the, um, and the ability to get past the gatekeepers, the ability for women and people of color in particular, progressive women and people of color to get past the gatekeepers, to get their voices out in social media in without gatekeepers above them. So creating their own independent YouTube videos, TikTok videos, uh, getting their messages on uh, th- out through Twitter and Facebook and et cetera. Black Lives Matter wouldn't exist in the way it exists now without Alicia Garza and Patricia Produce Colors um, and Opal Tometi starting the Black Lives Matter hashtag on Twitter after Michael Brown's murder. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and, and, and would not exist just because of Twitter. It was the Twitter hashtag, but then also the offline organizing in conjunction. Um, But when I say the gatekeepers, right, those messages were out there among political organizers. Alicia Garza was doing this work for decades, you know, Um, but the idea of finally being able to have a platform where you can get, your messages to a very wide range of voices, media, corporate media outlets, corporate news outlets then picked up those voices because they were uh, going to be left behind if they didn't. Um, and so the same thing has been happening to a smaller degree in entertainment content. So for example, Issa Rae, who's the producer and star uh, and writer of uh, Insecure on HBO, fantastic show, very specific show, I love it. It's not for me. It's a show by, and it's a love letter uh, by and for black women. But I love watching the show too, because the more specific a show, the more specific the characters, uh, sort of the more, it, sometimes the more relatable to a broad audience as well. Um, similarly to the One Day at a Time reboot, uh, starring Rita Moreno and a uh, Cuban American family in the reboot. Um, but Issa Rae specifically, she, uh, before she had her HBO show, she had a show that she created independently on um, called uh, The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. Yes. And it, it was, uh, she created her own following. It became very successful, slowly and steadily. Um, she just, uh, began gaining attention and eventually she got this incredible deal to bring her, her voice, her community, her kinds of visions to television. Um, to corporate television. Uh, and we're seeing that also with uh, with Michaela Cole, who is the British, uh, um, black British feminist woman who uh, created the show, I May Destroy You, also for HBO. Um, what's interesting with that story, uh, and this is, this is about the digging, right? Because so much of corporate media is still procedural crime dramas that exploit people of color and women. So much is still uh, the sitcom with the one schlubby guy who's a, a nudnik and he's, uh, you know, just 
he's he he doesn't take care of himself and he's not interesting and he's not funny and somehow he has a supermodel wife and he and she, she's just considered a nag right like that's that's a model for a lot of corporate sitcoms still unfortunately um but you have uh the example of i may destroy you on hbo which is uh for, which is doing something incredibly interesting with the narrative around sexual assault. It's really changing the way TV addresses uh, victims coming to the terms with trauma, um, how it involves the community, et cetera. And the reason that it's so interestingly done and so powerful and so uncomfortable and so nuanced and funny is because Michaela Cole turns down a huge, huge payday from Netflix because mm -hmm. she wanted editorial control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And HBO was able to give her that editorial control. So it's not that the industry itself has fully changed. It's that independent artists are pushing the industry. So you have people like Michaela Cole, you have filmmakers like Ava DuVernay, you have mm -hmm. uh, filmmakers and, uh, and TV show runners like uh, Issa Rae, you have shows like Pose, which, um, is doing something uh, incredible for trans representation on TV, not just in terms of incredible stories being told about trans people, but trans actors actually playing those characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, why am I, uh, Pfeffernan, Maura Pfeffernan, why am I think, forgetting the name of the of the show right now? Um, the, uh, forget, people will remember the show that oh, I'm talking yeah. about, they yeah. know it. Uh, where where um, the the father the the guy who played the grandfather and father on Arrested Development who turned out to be a sexual oh director. yeah trans something uh, transparent transparent thank yeah. you it's been a while um, great show yeah well it was a great show but you had you didn't have a trans person playing the main trans lead and then it turned out that behind the scenes the actor who was playing the trans character was sexually harassing trans supporting actors. In, ah. Right. So Pose is- I didn't something. hear that one. So yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, that's one okay. of the reasons that show wound down. Oh boy. Yeah. I so, wondered what happened to that show given it's, yeah, you never know. Hey, right. Jen, I um, we're speaking with Jen Posner, journalist, media critic, founding director of Women in Media News, the media analysis education advocacy group. Her new book is coming out soon. It's called Breaking the News. It's a critical media literacy graphic novel uh, given through an explicitly race and gendered lens. I do feel like I could talk to you all day. You fascinate me. Your work fascinates me. I do want to get your sense about this moment in history. We're seeing massive protests against racial injustice, historic attacks against reproductive rights, lawmakers who are going on vacation while millions of people, uh, you know, are suffering the impacts of this worsening pandemic. What can you say to consumers of media as we consume media during this moment in history? Okay, so that's a huge question. Um, we like to give you an open door for where you would like to go. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I think it's incredibly important to think critically and actively anytime you engage with media, whether it's news or whether it's a television show or whether it's a video game. Um, Anytime that, I, I think maybe if I had to give one piece of advice, the, the simplest piece of advice is never turn your brain off. Mm -hmm. That thing that we're conditioned to do that people say, oh, it's just a, it's just a movie, it's just a TV show, it's just a video game, it's just a song, it's just a video, it's just a press conference, it doesn't mean anything. It always means something. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about framing and messaging and impact. We have to think about who, is creating the message, who is the target audience of the message, um, whose voices are not, how would that message change if a different set of voices was included in the telling of it? Um, so whether that's about health, whether that's health stories, um, and you know, are we taking the right voices seriously? Are we really listening to letting the science decide what's good for us in the midst of a global pandemic, or are we listening to a really catchy, interesting looking meme 
on Facebook or TikTok um, or, you know, even think about media is in a really granular way. It's not even only a news story. It's not even only a television show. Media is also a fake badge that that has fake American uh, D Americans with Disabilities Act information using the logo on unauthorized way saying, I, I don't have to wear a mask uh, and you're not allowed to ask me why, but that's, people are just selling that stuff on Etsy now. Mm -hmm. That's not real, right? right? <laughs> that's media though. That's a piece of media being used as disinformation. Um, so we need to think very critically about where our information comes from and what that information and what that entertainment is trying to tell us about ourselves and other people and the world around us. Um, what, what do you think is the, the final question here? What do you think is the responsibility of the press at this moment when the stakes for our democracy and survival are so high? Oh God, uh, we, we as citizens in, in this country, we as, and, and people who are not citizens, but are concerned members of the, of the community, um, need to hold journalists accountable and media outlets accountable for accuracy and for substance. And so for example, we are in a moment right now where this election is may very well determine whether we have a democracy in 10 years or not. Mm -hmm. We already have a president who has not committed to a safe and fair transfer of power. He has refused to commit to that. He told Fox News he refused to commit to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we just you know, thought, we'll yeah. see, he says. We'll see. This is what dicta and and this is a this is not just an idle thing. He's he's only shared love for dictators over the last five years. Putin, G, uh it, Etc. Down the line, North Korea, he, this is a man who, those are his role models. He wants to be our dictator. You gotta get rid of this guy. <laughs> so at this point, we need journalists to focus on substance. So for example, in the last two days, we've already seen Newsweek run a story, run, a, run an op-ed about Kamala Harris questioning whether she is qualified to be vice president because of birtherism, because her parents were not born here, which is but not- she was born. Yes, she was born here. And yet Newsweek has expanded birtherism to allow somebody with an agenda, to, with a clear right-wing agenda and a racist agenda and a misogynist agenda to revive the birtherism that Trump uh, fueled about Obama that helped him eventually become president and expand Just a birtherism has just become like code for racism. Code for racism, but also code for um, even beyond that, an, an extreme version of us versus them white nationalism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? An othering that goes beyond- Surprisingly. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> orange so, nationalism is orange, what we have. Orange going. nationalism. I love it. But but so the fact is we need substance from our journalists. We need substance from our news outlets. We don't need clickbait right now. We don't need I mean obviously Newsweek ran that story understanding that it would be shared far and wide but because it would generate outrage as well as support from right wingers. Um Jen, we need Yes, uh, no, go ahead. Finish your thought, but we are kind of out of time. Okay. <laughs> We need, we need substance. We need coverage of politics that focuses on policy and uh, and record, not clothes and hair and voice and oh, Kamala's voice is so scratchy or whatever. We need to really be clear. I love her voice. Are people saying that? I never even yeah, I mean, because because she's a female politician. So of course they are. They already are because that's the narrative about women in politics in the press. They are uh, their voices are nagging. They these people. It seems like these people can't help themselves in a certain way. I, I don't. I, we can't get off topic because we're pretty much out of time. But it's like I sit next to people who are like, oh, I like her shirt. I'm like, are you listening to what? She's <laughs> it's just I don't know. Um, more more to be discussed with yeah. Jen Posner. Uh, Jen, when is your book coming out? Um, that's in flux. It's 
forthcoming from first, second books as part Ooh. of World Citizen Comics series. Dan Rather has one on journalism. There's just, the first one in the series just came out. It's called Unrig. Mine is, I'm still writing it. So we, and because of pandemic, we just, we switch, we've, we're working on a, a new a date, uh, but it's forthcoming. Excellent. Well, we'll keep our eye on it and we'll hope hope to have you back to talk about all things that, like in the actual media right now, because sure. that is still always so important. Jen Posner, you can find her on Twitter at Jen, J-E-N-N-P-O-Z-N-E-R. Thanks for coming on the show, Jen. I appreciate it. Thank you too. Thanks for having me. And we'll talk about Kamala another time. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do that. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. We're new and growing and, you know, we're, we're doing pretty good so far. I'm Juliana Forlano. You can follow me on Twitter at Juliana Forlano, where I occasionally tweet uh, uh, semi-interesting uh, thoughts, just like pretty much everybody else on Twitter. Um, thanks again, everyone, for watching.